Greetings and salutations to our fine podcast audience. Welcome to episode 181. We made it. And Ed's eating. Yep. How's lunch, Ed? It's pretty good, it, you know, but it's late. So, you know, we already, it got backed up on me in time and I just Did you not manage your time well, Ed? That's probably what happened. Uh-huh. Yeah, but, but Ed asked, he did ask nicely before we hit record. He said, do y'all care if I eat? And I encouraged him to eat because- but he did. We hadn't had food on his podcast in quite some time. <laughs> And I'm so not sharing. Ed, don't know. Ed's not sharing. No, he's not. But. We don't know whether to apologize to those of you who have to watch it on the video podcast. I know. Or those of you who have to listen to it on like the us. audio podcast. So. I'm smelling it. I know you can't smell it, but... It's so white chicken it, chili. It's a fine chili he's got going yep. over there. So it's more like a soup. Yeah, it is not a thick chili. I it's was not say a that. thick chili. It's, it's did, more your, like, did your wife make that for you? She did. It's delicious. I'm sure it is. It really, really Becky's, good. A, Becky's a wonderful cook. But... I just didn't have, I had several meetings this morning, and then I didn't manage my time well. Well, there you go. So and now he's popping us on kids. We got out. So we got for, out the, for the audio listeners, yeah. they're like, what was that? <laughs> he's popping open yeah. a sun-kissed, sun-kissed zero. zero sugar orange. Mm. We got we to gotta get a name for this podcast soon. Things are falling apart. <laughs> name will bring us together. Speaking of names, someone did throw another name out on the form there. Throw it out. Imperfect pastors teaching imperfect people. That's pretty wordy. That's a lot. It is. It's a lot. A lot of imperfects there. It is. And you're assuming that, you know, we're imperfect, I guess. Yes. Well, I, I think I'll, that's a I'll safe assumption. That. Yeah, I think so. A but safe assumption. Thanks for that. Yeah. So we got um, today a couple of questions. One, yeah, I think. For. We got a two for. One is because I think we can answer it in possibly 60 seconds. Wow. I that, like that as a challenge. I also like that as a challenge. I'm going to say we can't. I don't think so. <laughs> that was an exaggeration on my part. But it will be a short discussion because I think it's a pretty straightforward answer. And then the other one uh, might require some discussion. Well, there we go. So you ready for You want the quick one first? Let's well, go on quick one. Let's you know the other thing I just noticed? And I know this has probably been this way a whole long time. Y'all probably can't see this, but I used to have a table. You did. <laughs> the, the truth is, the truth is, I guess if we're going to talk about this, he never had a table. There was a table that was a little off screen that I noticed in the last couple of episodes. I he had, had been pulling closer to himself <laughs> to place his things on, and I started looking in the frame on, on in the editing bay, going, "There's a table in the corner." I, and I had got a oh. table. Okay, yes, there is still a table. I have just placed it. Farther into the shadows so that you would not on see it. On the day that it, it, might, as much. it might as well not exist. But <laughs> that was the plan. Moving it farther away would make you not move it closer. All so. right. So, all right. So we've solved the riddle of the table. It has, well, thanks. True. Thanks was for bringing that. Was that 60 seconds? Yeah. More than that. All right. Here's the question. Quickie. Ready? The, the person even says this. They said, This is not an important or faith hinging question. <laughs> I'm glad. But just out of curiosity, in the book of Revelation, when it talks about different symbols representing the 12 apostles, is it including Judas as one of them? I don't think when you read the book of Revelation, trying to make one for one uh, analogies out of, or, you know, whatever the correct version of that is, mm -hmm. whether it's a simile, metaphor, yeah. analogy, how that works, uh, out of the symbols is the intended purpose. So uh, the the times where we see the number 12 mm -hmm. uh, representing, so like I think there's one point, there's 12 stars mm -hmm. or, or maybe, you know, whatever, 12 jewels or something, something. like that. Yep. Those things are meant to represent uh, Israel as a whole or a later nation. the church, mm -hmm. right? Because the church is the new Israel because mm -hmm. there were 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus then selects 12, 12 apostles, apostles as representing mm -hmm. kind of re rebirthing. But so what you're saying is trying to figure out where Judas sits in that whole thing is probably not even the point. No, you would have to read that. But I think he's number seven. Okay. <laughs> if you had to pick, he's number he's, seven. He's Slash closer, Matthias, and who replaces he, he's Judas. He's closer to the front than you probably think. Yeah, that's what I think. So. Okay. I think we did it. I okay. didn't count. I didn't count. I don't, have, I don't have anything to say other than you need to really stop reading Revelation trying to figure oh, yeah, yeah. all the stuff out oh, yeah. about the symbols. The s Read Scott McKnight's new book, yeah. Revelation, mm, for the yes. rest of us. Yeah. That's yes. what you should do. Yeah. That is what you should do. All right. Now on to the, I think, larger question. And not sure we've ever had this discussion before. 
Question Not is, even personally. Well, I don't know. Here's a question. I've heard you talk about elders of the church. Who are they? What's their role? And who appoints them to their position? Interesting. We do have elders. So thanks for being observant. Should we start by talking about why the church has elders? Well, Maybe that, that'll yeah, get us. Why, to why don't we start by saying I don't? We're not going to name them on this podcast no. only because. Uh, that's sort of the role they have here. But if you want to know them personally, if you will send us an email and we can have a conversation with you personally about it. We're not going to put it on the internet. We're just not going to put it out on the, on the internet for them. And these are volunteers. For the, they are volunteers. Mm-hmm. They aren't paid here. So we're not going to put their names out. But, uh, and they, they we will not dox the elders. <laughs> <laughs> giving their home addresses and yes. yeah, all, all of those All things. that kind of stuff. But that's not... That is not because we're ashamed of who they are. We're very no, proud of who they are. Absolutely. And you can definitely, if you will email us, you can definitely know who they so are by Elder name. at community-christian.net should get you the answers. That's right. There you go. Elder at community So, all right. So who are these uh, individuals and why are they a part of our church? Well, one, it is biblical yes. uh, to have in true. the New Testament writings to have, whether you call them elders or mm-hmm. some other kind of, a really a, uh, a, a group of people mm-hmm. who are mature in the faith, mm-hmm. um, who understand, um, you know, who have maybe more experience in, in the life of the kingdom. Well, that's but, one of the qualifications for being an elder. Yes, not absolutely. a brand new believer. Right. So. so these people who can be able to kind of give insight for church leadership, in mm-hmm. our case, that's the staff, right? Mm-hmm. The paid yep. staff. Yep. Um, but in some churches, it may just be one in particular pastor, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, to really kind of make sure that everything is lining up with the way that, at least to our understanding, that Jesus has outlined the church should go. Yeah, they they hold the responsibility in our church, I think in most churches, although, you know, particularly in our brand, which is non-denominational Christian church, that's mm-hmm. who we are, that's our heritage, which if you want to know more about that, we're part of the restoration movement, mm-hmm. <laughs> which are all independent. That's That's all three of our heritage. That's the heritage of our church from way back. They are people that hold on to the doctrinal integrity of the church. That's mm-hmm. their primary role and responsibility. Now, in smaller churches, they also serve lots of other functions that sure. staff people often perform in when they get into larger kind of situations. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think for the sake of when you go back to the why part of it, it does, and I know this goes to a question we had a couple weeks ago, and that we actually have coming up because uh, I just saw it's coming up on the in our in our question list. It's a way really to make sure that you do not have one you know person, one pastor who just who because they have a platform, which is the nature of any church, you have one who has a lot of authority just in that platform right. to get up and just start telling people to start doing things uh, and believing things and thinking ways and giving money and doing these things. Mm-hmm. Um, based on their own personal preference, or eventually, because we, we in, the, in that question we were talking about, mm-hmm. you know, what makes the difference between a church and a cult? Mm-hmm. The elders provide a lot of that in that it's not one central person just going up, and going, "Here's what I think you should yeah, do," mm-hmm, that's right. and here's this. They are able to step in mm-hmm. and go, "Well, let's talk about that, and yeah. let's figure out does this line up." With the Bible, with mm-hmm. you know Christian history, with all yep. the things, is this some brand new idea? Is this you know all of those and, things? And to be to be honest, that's what our elders do in their meetings. Yes. Is they, right. they sit with the scriptures and yes. they that's hash right. these things out in community together, so yeah, that we are following you know by consensus what the Lord, what the Lord's telling us. Yeah, I think most people would be surprised how much of our elders' meetings are. Their Bible study. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the, much, it isn't. I think sometimes when people ask the eldership thing, they're looking at a uh, well, and I. It is this way in some churches. At Community Christian, it is not this way. It's almost like I want to know what the org chart is to mm-hmm. figure out who is making the decisions that. Yeah. I can figure out how to go to their meeting and vote on something. <laughs> and who do I blame? Yeah, who do I who do I get to change things in the way that I want them? Mm-hmm. Because we operate in a democracy, 
people tend to think about how do I change what I want change? Who's who do I have to talk? Bring me your manager. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know yes. that's often what people think of. But I, our eldership has not worked that way from the very beginning. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because they didn't, they had been in churches that were oper- If you don't know, often in churches that work that way, you are one good vote away from a split. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. it's democracy tends to produce division, not <laughs> unity, <laughs> uh, which our country certainly is living up to. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think I think by and large, a good way to think of the way that. Uh, the role of the elders' work is really like guardrails mm. uh, that that sit along that as the church is going, you know, and they don't necessarily sit with the day to day decisions mm. of how things go. But if you but if things start kind of steering in a direction that it gets a little far off, once again, it's not uh, you're not going off the cliff. There's a guardrail that just kind of bumps back and goes, "Hey, have we thought about this? Have we talked about this?" It is a necessary part. Uh, to really, one, protect the church from coming under the influence of one central person to come in and take over and go, hey, I'm not really, we're no longer under Jesus' authority, you're under my authority. In fact, in churches where things go bad, usually one of the first steps is the pastor gets up and says, we have disbanded the elders, or we've gotten rid of the deacons, or we've gotten rid of this, because they will not submit to my authority. And Mm -hmm. that's always a good sign. But then it also provides support for the for the uh, leader, in that they can know once again, I am a servant here. Uh, my role really is to be a good steward of the position God has given to me. I am not the ultimate authority; mm-hmm. Jesus is, and this group of brothers and sisters yes. can walk alongside this with me, and I can know there's a lot of weight that can sit on you when you personally have to make all the decisions of Mm -hmm. the spiritual direction of people's lives, which is where things often get off track in um, larger organizations. I I think that was the genius of the early church fathers who who wrote about this and and laid this pattern out for us is they understood that. They understood the danger in... uh, uh, focusing power just in mm-hmm. one office or in one person, and so they wanted to keep that from happening because. And we just talked about this in a meeting that we were all just sitting in. The primary focus of those early church writings is the unity of the church. Mm-hmm. That's right. And if if the structure of the 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 elders is not set up in a way that promotes unity, it, it is it is going against Jesus's ultimate prayer for his body. That's right. In the church. So uh, that that is the purpose. It is unity. In, yeah. in, 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 unity in uh, doctrine, unity in just relational things. Yeah. All, all things. Unity. Well, in the way that we relate, you know, we as a church have always been uh, the kind of church that is focused now, the phrase we use now is on the one, mm-hmm. on, on the person who... Uh, you know, has not yet come into the kingdom. We want to disciple what we call the 99, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to draw in. We want to equip the 99 to reach the one. And that's a big part of, too, why you want to have elders that are not just uh, biblically sound, but really a part of your church to understand that heart and that DNA of Mm -hmm. let's always keep that at the central. Are we getting too far away from that mission that Jesus has given us, which clearly is found in the scriptures, but it's helpful when they have had the history and the culture of the church and all of that is a key part. That may get us to the part where I know one of the questions was something about how they're appointed. Yeah, that was going to be my final question is uh, what's the process of uh, a man or woman becoming an elder? So our our process has always been, um, it, again we don't we don't do democracy. Yeah, we don't vote. <laughs> we we don't we just don't see that in the scripture. We mm-hmm. don't think just because we're in a country that believes in democracy that we ought to somehow now submit to that kingdom. We we do allow when there is a need for more elders. So we've had through the years. Uh, I'll say this, there are no elders who were elders when we started who are still elders. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because either age or movement of their families Mm -hmm. out of here, um, there are none of those. The longest serving elder we currently have probably has been, he has been serving 
Mm, he's he may be coming up on seventeen years at this point. Okay. Uh, but he's the longest serving. He's at a point that you know he's been around here a lot. He sort of held the thing together, but around him has circled a whole bunch of people. What happens is the process is the elders, as a group, every year talk through their qualifications to serve, their stage of life, or am I still at a place where I should serve mm-hmm. by health, by the nature of my family, by the nature of what's happening in my relational world? Do I have the time and the spiritual desire to commit to this? Yeah. The other elders also comment on, <laughs> do you have, do we sense that? And we have had times where we've said to someone, hey, we think you ought to step away for a season. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, those people are still in our church. So mm-hmm. I guess it was handled relationally okay that that's still, I mean, the evidence is they're still around. Yeah. Uh, though they could have done what other people do and get upset and leave. Uh, and then once it becomes apparent that there's either a need by, hey, some people are getting older and we need to begin to work some newer people in, we have a process which whereby apprentices, people that are recognized in our congregation as one, they're not new believers. Mm-hmm. They're not new to community Christian. So even if even if you're a veteran believer, but you just started coming to community Christian six months ago, yeah. uh, you need to know the nature of our family mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. who we are. Uh, you are asked, are you interested in serving alongside of these elders? And so then they generally walk alongside, which means they come to the meetings, they participate in the discussions, because we don't vote, it's not really a problem. We're not having votes in those meetings. We operate by consensus. Yes. Which means we have to talk about it long enough that we come to a place we agree. Mm-hmm. Which there, I think of one discussion I want to tell you was, we had a seven-year discussion once. Mm. Yep. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> we, that it just, to, it, to take the time to allow people to get where they need to mm-hmm. get on something. Yep. Uh, and that's part of trusting the Spirit of God to lead that's right. as well. That's right. You know, that's what we think. Yeah. So then once they come along and then the, el- the, the, the appointed elders, the ones that have come to that point, say, we think this person's right and we think it's time, we will say to the existing congregation, these people have been walking with us for a time. We think they are ready to serve as elders. We will put their name and their face up in front of people. Back when we had three campuses, it meant Mm -hmm. you had to have your picture Mm -hmm. on the screen for several weeks and say this person, uh, the elders believe this person should be considered by our congregation to be an elder. And what we ask, again, because we're not voting, Mm -mm. we're not not allowing any kind of secret ballot where you get to to vote somebody out. Uh, we say, if you know of a reason they shouldn't, looking at the biblical qualifications, or you know something about their life that would negate them to serving, you go and talk to them and tell them the reason you think they shouldn't. If you and them don't agree at the end of it, like they haven't helped you understand why you've misunderstood or you haven't gotten them to back down, then you come to one of us and we will go with them. But that person will not be able to pass through the process until that's sort of worked so out. Yeah. And then at the end of a certain time that we set aside that that part takes place, if there are no remaining n- conversations going about the person, they become an elder of the c- congregation at Community Christian. Mm. All right. And so that's, <clears throat> that's the current process. There you go. I think we've answered the question. I think so, too. All right. I bet that has raised more questions for some people, particularly people that come from other churches. Oh, Oh, sure. Or for people that were looking for a way to get something done. Sure. (laughs) Either one. Whatever. (laughs) And on that note, you're free to ask another question. Yeah. That's right. You know? The interesting thing for me is how often I get asked from people, how do you get to become an elder. I would like to become an elder. And I said, well, that question is probably not the starting point. That's right. right. <laughs> if you really, really, really want it, you probably don't yeah, yeah, need you, to be. You one. start by, sir, everybody at Community Christian serves their way. Yes. yes. You serve well, the body. And it is not necessarily just an us decision. It is a God decision. That's right. That's right. God must bring it to the forefront. We, we, and, and, and Ed didn't say this, but I know he implied it. A lot, All of this stuff that he just described is 
completely led and bathed in prayer. Oh, oh com- yes. constantly. Prayer is the driving thing that moves all of those things forward. Yes. So through prayer and just allowing God to lead and watching what the Spirit does yep. and how He orchestrates all of that is a, is a part of the process too. So, all right, that's it. Uh, next week we're gonna uh, get into a little more cultish talk. Yay! That should be fun because we did that a couple of weeks ago, and so we got a somebody, up. somebody, somebody's got more, more so, questions, more, <laughs> more cult questions. Y'all ready for this? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. So we're gonna do that next week. So well, if they're ready, I I have to be ready. Of course. <laughs> Finish your soup, and, <laughs> we'll, be, and we'll be so, back next week. I will finish my soup before to, the next talk. All right. So y'all have a great week. See you next time.